Good morning, I'm so glad that you found us on Facebook and are worshiping with us this morning. Make sure to like our page so that you can uh, be notified when we worship each week. Uh, and feel free to interact in the comment section below. Let us know prayer requests, ask questions, uh, and introduce yourself to your community. I hope that this morning's service blesses you. Our scripture today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there were no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door. And he was speaking word to them, a word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay, which Jesus saw their face. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. N now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the which is easier to say to the paralytic paralytic you your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and take the mat and walk but so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic i say to you stand up and take your mat and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went outside before all of them. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We had never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This poem is based out of the Gospel of Mark, and it's where Jesus comes back and he's addressing this humongous crowd. The need for healing is so great that, that they drop this paraplegic man from the roof. He is, he is laid down in front of Jesus and, and he heals this man and he allows this man to get up and walk. I wanted to write from a perspective of a person that needed that healing, but also being in a space where he got to witness someone that really needed healing. I think all of that, all of that, and this poem, it really comes together with, what if I was in that crowd amongst all these people that felt just the way I did, and they wanted to be in that front of that line, so. Yeah. Heal. He is back. I heard him once in a crowd of many. I heard power through what seemed to be a sea of people. I heard he was a healer of some sorts. I heard he heals with words and how. How can words heal? How can words be spoken to heal fractured souls and impaled hearts? How can love be spoken in such manner? I heard him slightly, I claw my way through the jungle of people. I use shoulders to maneuver my way to the front for I needed healing, but I am no one special. My momentum slows down as I remind myself that I am no one special. Doubt has blanketed me for so long. So if there's answers, this man of God must have them. I witness, I try to make my way through heaviness, through my heaviness. I make my way through traditions to bear witness to this new idea. I now try to catch the rays from this sun. Let my heart feel the warmth. And as I step forward, I feel those pull at me and they rip me with the sameness, with shame. We are the righteous. 
I feel their tugs, their privileged hands that know not of faith or humanity. And who is he, they say? What gives him the right, they say? I reach out. I reach out and we touch fingertips for a moment, just a moment. And as my spirit pauses me, it speaks. Step to the side. There are those that need more. And through the roof, the need is lowered. Those that have power less than I, I step to the back and all I can do is stand in awe. You are forgiven, he speaks. The Son of God speaks to the Son of God. Weight is lifted. The man stands up for the very first time. I stand with him for the very first time. We are forgiven. He forgives me. I forgive myself. I heal. I love. I walk for the very first time. Well, good morning and welcome to worship together at Chapelwood. I've been missing being with you, even though you're not here. I know you're out there. I've been worshiping with you online, uh, but I'm thrilled to be back as we continue this sermon series around the feet of the rabbi, the rabbi Jesus. And as we sit at the feet of the rabbi Jesus, we are listening. We're listening to the words that he teaches us and we're learning those words. We're learning those lessons. But we're also, by being in the presence of Jesus, we are growing. Growing in our devotion. Growing in our love of God and of one another. And then also, when you learn at the feet of the rabbi, the rabbi teaches in ways that are real and practical. Walking through villages, healing diseases in those who are sick. Speaking the right word at the right time. And as one who is a disciple who follows after Jesus, we also assimilate his ways. We imitate the rabbi. And so we learn, we grow in our devotion, but we also assimilate his ways. And th today in this passage of scripture, we see uh, another example of those who are at the feet of the rabbi Jesus. And we hear and see and sense the challenge to something more than what we just learned that dives into challenging us how we grow in our devotion of love of one another and of God, and how we see the world differently, which then moves us out to assimilate his ways, to live a different life. You know, old professor of mine, Fred Craddock, says that this passage in Mark chapter 2 of the paralytic being healed, he said, here is the church in miniature, a person being sustained by the faith of others, when his own condition, physical, spiritual, mental, is at least temporarily far short of sufficient. Here is the church in miniature, where a person is being sustained by the faith of others, when their own condition is far short of being sufficient. Now, I don't know about you, but I have felt that I have been far short of sufficient in these days and months that we find ourselves. And there are new things popping up every day. New things in the news, new things in the world, new things in our community, new things in our school district, new things in our sporting teams. Every day there's anxiety and uncertainty. And then we have division, and angst about how we view the things of the world. And I really want to bring this home again, as I've shared with a lot of you that I've been meeting with and talking with on the phone or emailing. I want to really bring it back to what is the most important and central thing we must do as Christ followers. And that is to make sure that the light is shined on Jesus Christ. He is the one we follow. And he is the one we take marching orders from. And so I ask you, what does the church look like when it's at its best? What does the church look like when it's at its best? I can tell you right now, as I look around the world and I listen to Christians and I listen to pastors and I, I hear how churches are talking to one another, I can tell you 
that the church God desires is missing in action a little bit. Not, not totally, but in a lot of ways. There's immorality, there's uh, struggle, there's division, there's strife, there's insensitivity, there's an irreverence, there's a way that we, we talk to one another, we insult one another as Christians. I find it surprising. I saw this week on social media that there were some people who were Christians who were insulting other people of other ideological persuasions, and they insulted them by calling them sheep. They called them sheep. You bunch of sheep just following the whatever you think, and it's not all. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, sheep is probably the worst insult that a Christian could ever use because Jesus refers to us Christians as sheep lost without a shepherd. And so Christians who use sheep as an insult is a confusing thing to me. And, and I guess to go a step further, I would say Christians who use insults of any kind is really hard for me to understand. But in this church, when the church is at its best, when the church is at the center, when there's no longer business as usual, there is something that defines the church. There's something that defines the work and the role of Jesus in the middle of the church, and that's change. We don't like change. We can't stand change. We are in the midst of so much change, and yet we're now broken apart in so many different pieces because we don't like change. We don't want change. We want to get back to normal. We want to get back to control. We want to get back to the way everything was. We don't do change well. And yet, the church is at its best. The church of Jesus Christ is at its best when it is a church that operates no longer with business as usual. Remember how everything that Jesus said, how everything that Jesus did, how everything that Jesus moved, who he handled, who he touched, who he spoke to, everything he did presented, presented a dilemma for those who were in the established positions. Every healing presented a dilemma to the way people understood how healings happen. Every, every teaching in the moment where there were scribes and Pharisees around him, even today in Mark 2, the scribes were there and present. What Jesus does in this moment confounds them. It changes them. It pushes them out of what they know is business as usual. This is what Jesus does, by the way. This is who Jesus is. And yet, when we are facing days of change and uncertainty and longing for normalcy and stability, we have to remember the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus in our day and in our places, who has the final word, who gives the final answers regarding human and institutional predicament, the church at its best invades normalcy and creates a new normal. I see that trying to break through now. And yet so many of us good Christian folk, and I participate as a blocker sometimes too, we're, si we're fighting so hard against the new normal, against the dictates of the kingdom of God. And we are giving way to the whims of the culture to the powers and the voices and the principalities that are not rooted in kingdom language. Jesus comes to us in a pandemic, and he sits with us. This is what he's done for me. He sits with me, and as I lay out all of the things that I believe should be happening and how this should be over and we should be able to get back to normal and we should be able to do all of these things, I hear Jesus sit and challenge me in the same ways that he challenged all of those in the New Testament. John, where your heart is right now reflects what you really treasure. Do you not know, John, that the Lord takes care of the birds and the flowers and you are of 
such more worth than those things. Do you not believe, John, that I can take care of you as well? Do you not believe, John, that when I see sheep without a shepherd, those who are lost and are hurting, do you not believe that I don't see you in this moment, that somehow you think you have to figure out all the right answers and know all the right things? Guess what, John? In a global pandemic, there aren't really any right answers. Nobody's going to do it exactly right. And so can you step back and just be with me, be a part of the church as it's, as it's supposed to be, listening to my voice once again. You know, the other thing I'll say is that the church is at its best when the church is about prophecy and not programming. The church is at its best when it's about prophecy, not about programming. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. In the Hebrew Bible, we have these great uh, lessons from the, the, the wisdom literature. It says, where there is no vision, the people will perish, they'll die. That's the King James Version. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. The New Century Version says, where there is no word from the Lord, people become uncontrolled. And the New American Standard says, where there is no prophecy, people become demoralized. Vision, a word, prophesy. Prophecy is the way that God speaks to us. Vision is the, the picture, the image that God gives to us to live into the future in which we find ourselves. And yet many of us are without God's vision right now. We haven't been listening for God's vision right now. And so what happens, the, the Hebrew Bible says that when there is no vision, when there is no word to be heard, or when we're not listening to the word, and when there's no prophecy to be heard, we become perishing uncontrolled and demoralized. When you add all that up and you put it in a shaker, it leads to disobedience and then it leads to disorder and then it leads to something, starts with the letter D, that I really, really do not like. It leads to drama. Have you ever experienced drama? Drama in your relationship, drama in your marriage, drama in your household with your children. If you are not experiencing drama in your household right now as your children have been home since March, you are doing something wrong. Or else you've shipped them off somewhere and they haven't come back yet. I don't know how you're doing it, but there is drama. Drama, disorder, disobedience, they are all rooted in the lack of vision. Right now in our country, in our world, the biggest missing piece I see, everybody tries to attack all the different perspectives and give the truth and the right. The biggest problem we have in our country is we do not have a clear sense of vision for our work and our role together as the body of Christ. And we need a clear and compelling vision. You see, when there's diminishing vision and revelation, the revealed knowledge of God, when that's missing, it means that people will give very little value to what God is saying. Sound familiar? And they will begin to value what they are saying or what others are saying or what powers and principalities they put their trust in are saying. When people give very little value to what God is saying, then they only become concerned about their own opinions. And they only become concerned about their own world. Little value to what is preached. Little value to what comes from God's Word. Little value to what the Holy Spirit sends to us and speaks to us and discerns in our hearts and in our lives. We become more concerned with our own self-interest. And this is where we see ourselves now. A society and a church that is more concerned with its own self-interest than it is by seeking out 
a central vision from God. A church at its best is a church that is more impressed with God than it is with itself. A church at its best is a church that focuses on the things Jesus focuses on, who, that focuses on the liberating things, that focuses on the things that grow love, focuses on the things that bring healing and wholeness. I'm talking about church at its best. I'm, to, I'm talking about church at its best that speaks truth in love, not, not sharing or misleading with, with fake news or fake articles or fake opinions or any of those things. The church at its best is a church that remembers that at its center is Jesus Christ. And we go to his words and we watch his life and we sit at his feet and we put away all the other competing loyalties. That's the church at its best. That's the church at its best. And here today in Mark chapter 2, we see a conflict. That's the very beginning of the gospel of Mark, but we see a conflict that will last and a conflict that points exactly to what I'm talking about today and what the church is to be about and how we as Christians are called to live in these difficult days we find ourselves. You see, right here in Mark 2, we are already seeing it reported that there are conflicts in Capernaum Jesus returns to his preaching home. And in this space, there are people who have followed him. And some of them are people who are seeking out Jesus to be healed because they are lost and hurting and tired, sheep without a shepherd. But others are scribes and they, they want to be there because they feel and see and sense that what Jesus is doing is and somehow is in conflict to their normal, in conflict to their worldview. And somehow what he's saying doesn't jive up to the power structure language. And so they have to be present. And we see here conflict. You're always going to have conflict when there's a drastic difference of opinion. You haven't seen any differences of opinion in the lives you've been leading lately, I'm sure. But whenever you see drastic division in types of opinions, you're going to have conflict. And here's the first one. In this house, in this house where Jesus is preaching, where all of the people are gathered together and on the edges of the inside of the room that's stuffed so much that you can't get in the door. The doorway is blocked. The window's blocked. Everything is blocked. And here we have all of the, the people listening from their own different perspectives and we see the conflict beginning. In this corner over here, are the powers and the principalities, the scribes who are holding on to the religious structure, the religious institution. And, and they have a drastic difference of opinion of what Jesus is all about. They think they know Jesus so well. But the same is true of people in other parts of the room. They're not in the religious establishment. They don't have power. These are just people who are hungry, who are longing, who are lonely, and they seek out Jesus because they know he brings a good word. But they're also limited in their, limited in their own worldview, in their own way of seeing the world, in their own way of understanding who's in and who's out and who's right and who's wrong. This is in their definition too. So everyone now is in this place and they are looking at the one Jesus that they thought they knew so well. And so you have religious leaders and structures. You have the ordinary people and the way that they see the world, the way they understand how things will work. And then you have seated Jesus. Then you have seated Jesus in this space, in the corner. The Jesus who really is Jesus. And now a new reality is beginning to play out in this very small house right in front of them. God begins to shift the normal. God begins to, to tinker with the regular. He begins to disrupt the ordinary. The business as usual now begins to turn over into some new kind of reality. You see, there's always conflict. There's always conflict between what was and what is on the way. And Jesus represents 
everything about God that is on the way. And so to think that it doesn't come into conflict with every single mind in that room is a little naive on our part, whether you're a religious leader or a fisherman. What Jesus is saying and doing is going to conflict with your ways of knowing. There's conflict in the gaps. There's conflict between the way it's always been done. I can't tell you how many people I see in the grocery store or out or in one mask. It's hard to identify the church members with masks on, but we find a way to do it. And everybody says, I can't wait until we get back to normal. And, and I know what they mean. They want this to be over. But as I've said to people over and over again, as we unpack that, you know, to be back to normal is to regress. It's to move backwards. Things are different. And they will always be different from here on out. And so now we see these gaps in the conflict. Conflict between the way it's always been. Conflict between the way we want it to be, but it's not that way now. All these great crowds followed Jesus. They gathered and they filled this house. Sanctuary is full. There's no room in the house for anyone else. No room in the door, no room in the window, no room at all. And then something happens. A group of friends who are not inside the church. A group of friends who are on the outside. A group of concerned citizens. They started a new initiative. They started a new initiative outside the walls of the house. And in doing so, it began a selfless mission. Now think about all of this. The ways we understand Jesus preaches and teaches, the way church preaches and teaches inside the wall, in the pew, to hear it with your ears in that time and in that space, and all of the conflicts of the expectations of the religious structures and just the people, the everyday people, everything. There's a gap, there's a conflict, there's stress, and outside we don't even know it, there is a selfless mission that is beginning, as opposed to a selfish mission, which sometimes we see inside the room of some of the power structures still trying to protect their own places and spaces. These people on the outside were able to look beyond the problem. Beyond the problem of this man's pain who is paralyzed on a pallet. To look beyond his incapacitation. To look beyond his trauma and his stress, all that was beyond his control, they saw him. They didn't pass by him. They didn't ignore him. And I, and I ask myself, how many of us are dealing with trauma and stress that's outside of our control? God, would we not call you to give a vision of those who are outside the walls of the church meeting to begin to, to grasp hold of a new vision of selfless service to meet the needs of the trauma and the stress, even the trauma and the stress unknown by so many people. And so they pick him up. They pick him up, these four friends, they pick him up and they arrive at the house with Jesus. And guess what? When they get to the house with Jesus, you can't get in. You can't get in through the door and you can't get in through the window. There is no way to get in. All of the ordinary modes by which you enter into the building are off limits. They're closed. Now, I don't know about you, but my grandmother, God bless her soul, my meemaw, taught me to be a door person. When I was very little and we would enter a, a building or a room or a church, she would take me through the door. And I learned as I grew up and I began to move to new places and experience new things and, and I wanted to go inside a building. Because I was a door person, I looked for the doors and I'd find them. Sometimes they're locked. And you have to come back. But I always look for the door. I'm a door person. Yeah, most of us are door people. That's what we've been trained to be. I can tell you a, a couple of times in my life as a door person where I have gone through a window. 
I did it on, a, uh, on my 1969 uh, Dodge Charger uh, out the window to try to be like a race car driver back when the windows were big enough that you could actually climb out a window. That was just for fun, but I also remember one time I locked my keys in my house and there were no other sets. And there was one small, already little cracked window that I could sort of knock out and go through and fix. And so at that time I couldn't get through the door, the door person uh, being that I am, and I had to make my way through a window because it was the only other option. But these friends don't have the door as an option. And these friends don't even have the window as an option. So you know what they do? They go climb up on the roof and they begin to dig. And as everyone's talking in the small house below, you can, the thatch and the, and the dirt and the hay begins to fall among them. And they don't know what's going on until a hole breaks open and they drop their friend in down right in the middle of it. They unroof the church and they drop their friend right in the middle, right in front of Jesus. And I think to myself, of all the ways that I have ever entered a space, the doors and windows, I have never gone through a roof. I think just that story alone speaks to something. It speaks to, again, the, the conflict and the division and how when God is at work moving in the world, something confronts the normal. It counters it challenges it. I mean, who ever heard of anyone coming through a roof? I praise God for people who are being the church even when they can't meet in the church. I think about this story and it makes me think of this thing that has been often um, resonating in my mind. I think about the Christians we are called to be, these Christians on the outside looking for the need. Some of us are so consumed with having to have church, with having to meet in church. Some of us are so consumed. It's the desire of my heart as well. But some of us are so focused on having church that we have forgotten to be the church. And that's when we fail. There is nothing that has stopped us from being the church. I praise God for those who can see in me and work in me. I praise God who see in you. I pray for friends who can look at you and see that you are one they need to pick up on a pallet. And if you have friends like that in your life, you better call them up today and tell them how much you love them and appreciate them. And maybe you need to be that friend to look out for those who are on the pallet with their trauma and their stress. Some of them, they don't even know it. Maybe you need to reach out to them outside the appropriate boundaries and the walls and just be there and speak a word. This is the vision God is giving us to be the church in a season when we can't have church. Maybe, maybe it'll focus us just a little bit better. I'll close with this because I know it has focused us in so many ways, in ways that have humbled me and caused me to see and understand and think things about how this church does ministry. Uh, it really, new categories. I think about our, our Fairhaven food pantry that we continue to talk about and we continue to talk about it for the reason that it's something we never thought possible. We never envisioned that our Fairhaven food pantry would go from serving 300 people per year, families per year, to now serving 300 families per day since March 24th, serving 500 tons of food, weekend bags for kids who've been out of school, how our, our pastors and 
our advocates in that and our serving ministry have not only been helping to secure rent relief for families that are in danger of losing their houses or their apartments because they've been out of work, but even have gone down to the courthouse to the hearings with the city to advocate on their behalf to try to get more money poured into rent relief and rent assistance. The church at work that sees people in their stress and in their trauma is not afraid to move outside the walls of the church. Not afraid not just to listen to the words of Jesus, but to grow in love and devotion of other people around us, not just the ones that look like us, and also to assimilate his ways, to move out into those spaces and places and to create a palette that someone who can't get up on their own, that we can pick them up. I think about off and on this whole summer, 200 plus teenagers who gathered here the best we could with COVID protocols to, to do service work, to work on homes in the community and Kashmir Gardens and other places and to see them working together to help people's homes they live in, people who are under trauma and stress and have no other recourse, no other way. And we have our children who are going outside the walls, selflessly seeing the need. I think about all the calls that have been made by all of our staff. Maybe there's not as much programming going on, but now what steps up is the prophecy. Tell us about your life, what's happening in your life. And we're learning stories of hurt and fear and despair. That's not directly connected to their day, that day or yesterday, but to someone in their family that they love and that they care for, that they can't go and visit, they can't sit beside, and they need someone to pray with them and talk to them about that. I see Fairhaven uh, United Methodist Church, part of our campus at Chapwood and Linda Padovani, who and, and some other ladies have made 3,400 masks that they've given out to people in need, older adults who can't get out and delivered these masks to nursing homes and to uh, health care workers. And then I think just this past week, of our good friend Mark Brown. Mark, uh, a constable here in Precinct 5, has been working security for us for many, many years. And, and I got to know Mark before and after services and during the weekdays as he always had a smile for everyone who walked in and out of this church in his plain clothes or in his uniform. He would playfully play with the kids on Christmas Eve, and parents loved him. When we merged Fairhaven into our family of, of churches at Chapelwood, uh, Mark went to do the security at the Fairhaven campus because that was closer to his home and where he lived. I remember not that long ago I was over on the campus, and he had been fixing up his truck. He loved to fix up his truck, and he was a real outdoorsy guy, and he had fixed up this old truck that he had, and he was so proud of it. A truck that many people would look at and go, I don't think there's much you can do with that truck. <laughs> but he had it running, and he told me everything that he did and how he worked on it. And, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to lie, some of it just went way right over my head. But when he got done, he looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, You know, if you ever need anybody to help you with your car, let me know. Of course, I'm just thinking, mine's made of computer machines. You plug it into the wall. I don't know how to work my car. So, A kind and gentle spirit and soul who contracted COVID-19 was in the ICU for over a month. And his body, as hard as he fought, was not able to, uh, was not able to defeat that disease. And we will celebrate his life. But I'm also aware of how so many people in this church have selflessly, quietly, in ways you'll never know, walked alongside Mark and Michelle and their kids, have been a voice of support for them. They have been those friends who have laid down a pallet and put that family on it, all of them, in the midst of their trauma and their stress what they understand of it, and some they don't even know yet. And they will find a way to carry their friends, 
to put their friends right in the middle of it with Jesus. Whether it comes through a door or a window or whether it comes through the roof. Jesus will be ready for you and for us all. And I pray that we would be able to see the vision God has for us. That Jesus remains primary focus. That his ways become our ways. Let us give up control. And let us selflessly give to God and to one another. This is the message of the gospel. Amen. Will you join me in a prayer? Gracious God, I pray that all of us who are within the church who think of ourselves as your guardians would allow us to let go of control, would allow us to see how you've sent your son to work at liberating people, to setting them free from the old and misguided notions of who God is and what God is doing. I know this for a fact. Jesus has no interest in defending you, O God, just for the sake of defending you. Jesus always had an interest in helping the people around them live full lives, liberating what binds people, whether they're bound by paralysis of body or by a faulty notion of who God is, or maybe they're just broken in spirit and mind. Lord, I know that you are a God who shines a light into a new way of thinking. And so I pray today that, that you would illumine us to see the situation before us, to find unity in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, speak to us. We want to be the church as it is meant to be. Amen. Go in grace. And as you go with your family, wherever you are, know that you are loved and that Jesus is with you. Be the selfless helper for those that you find in your lives. And don't be afraid to let one of those selfless helpers come beside you to help you in your time of need as well. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray and give thanks. Amen.